I'm here, I'm here for two, two reasons. Number one is because I think today is a celebration of the great work that so many of you have done. That so many of you have done. You know, I, this year is the 30th anniversary of the Harwood Institute. I've been doing this work for, for 30 years, even though I'm only 29 now. <laughs> and uh, this work, with a great partnership with the American Library Association, has been the fastest growing work that we've done in 30 years. And Michigan has been in the lead of that effort. And I'm proud to be here with you today. And there's a payoff. In a survey that's in um, your brochure, 70% of you say that you've talked to new parts of your community that you hadn't talked to before. Over 70% of you say that the media, as negative as they sometimes can be, is there any media here today? <laughs> Good, because I'm going to rail on them a bit. <laughs> that the media is recognizing your positive efforts in your community. And 50% of you say that you believe that your community is starting to see the library in a new light. That's a great payoff already. And so, number one, I'm here to help celebrate with you and to salute your great efforts and to say how fantastic they are and how proud I am that we had the opportunity to partner with you in this work. The second reason why I'm here is because I believe we need you now more than ever moving forward. That I believe that amid our celebration, we need your efforts to go larger, to spread deeper, to go higher than ever before for this fundamental reason. I think in our country today, we face a fundamental choice that we need libraries for. We can either stay on the path of division and acrimony that our country is now rooted in and can't seem to escape, or we can choose a path that discovers what we share in common in our communities and begin to build upon it. And we need libraries. Yes, libraries to help us move forward to, to discover what we share in common and to actively build upon it. You with me? Yeah. And I think this is more important than ever before. I think we live in confusing and troubling times today. I was in Grand Rapids last night talking to a dozen or more citizens, a cross section of folks from across Grand Rapids, Lowell, and surrounding communities. And they told me that our humanity is at risk right now in our country. When I asked them what's going on and asked them for a single word to describe it, the words they came up with were disarray, discord, dysfunction. People said that they're scared and in survival mode. People said regardless of who you voted for in the last presidential election, that before the election people were people. And now we can't seem to find one another in our communities and in this country anymore. It seems as though our public discourse has devolved in a set of grievances. Each a group, every group, seems to have a set of grievances, right? And when you listen to those grievances, so many of them sound legitimate and real that people care about. Except the louder our debates about these grievances become, the more we seem to just talk past one another and make no progress on them. Our public discourse has become more about what we're against than what we're for, right? about why our side of town is right and the other side of town is wrong, about why our political party is right and the other political party is wrong, about why our faith is right and why all other faiths are wrong. Heck, last night, there was a gentleman sitting just to the right of me with tears in his eyes, and he said, it's not just our politics that's gotten this way. He said, I can't even talk to my daughter anymore about what's going on in our community and in this country. What am I going to do? We have too many political leaders who are more concerned about their own personal agenda than our public agenda. And it's not just in Washington, DC. Randy may not like me saying this, but it's here in Lansing, in the state capital. It's in our local communities. More concerned about their personal agenda than our common agenda. We have too many organizations in our communities that are more concerned about their own survival than the civic health of our communities. We can't create the kind of society we want if this is the way in which we're going to work. There is a lot at stake. As I said last night in Grand, Rap Grand Rapids, our humanity seems to be at stake. It seems to me that we have a choice about whether or not we will honor each and every person's dignity 
in our communities, regardless of where they're from, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of their zip code. We have that choice. It seems to me we have a choice about whether or not we will engender real hope in our communities or whether or not we'll be purveyors of false hope. And it seems to me that we have a fundamental choice about whether or not we're going to make communities a common enterprise or whether or not we're going to assist that every person go it alone on their own. We need libraries more now than ever before. You are our most trusted organization and institution in our communities. You have been gateways for immigrants, gateways for learning, gateways for financial literacy, gateways for people creating things together. You are not only nice to have, you are essential in terms of our future moving forward as a democracy and as a flourishing society, we need you. You still with me? So what I want to talk about are three things that you probably already heard folks from the Institute talk about. But I want to re-emphasize today as you celebrate what you have achieved so far, which is, which is great and fantastic. And as you think about going bigger and broader and deeper and higher as you move forward into the future. But before I mention these three things, I just want to touch on something that Randy, Randy Dykeis mentioned a few minutes earlier. It seems to me that we, each of us in this room, have a choice about what direction we're going to face in our work. And as many of you know, I believe that we need to turn outward toward our communities. Because if we're not turned outward toward our communities, how in God's name can we actually see and hear one another? If we're not turned outward toward one another, how can we know what really matters to people in their lives and what their lived experiences really are and how our work can be relevant and significant and impactful in their lives. If we're not turned outward toward one another, how can we honor one another's sense of dignity, which in my mind is non-negotiable. It's a birthright. It's not something you earn, it's something you got when you were born. If we're not turned outward toward one another, how can we make our communities a common enterprise where we're all pulling in a common direction around our shared values and shared aspirations to ensure that every single American has a fair shot at the American dream and can fulfill their God-given potential. We cannot do it if we're turned inward. We must be turned outward toward one another. And so as we turn outward, there are three basic things I think we need to focus on. Now, I could have come here and given a really sophisticated talk about all the complex and complicated things I think need to happen. And it might have sounded good, and I might have felt important, but it wouldn't have been worth a hill of beans. Because I think right now in our country, at least during the time that I've been doing this work for 30 years, we got to get back to basics. We've got to get back to basics if we're going to restore our dignity, restore a sense of hope, and make community a common enterprise. So three basic things. Number one, we've got to focus on what we share together on what we share together. You know, so many times, and this, what this means is we literally have to change the conversation, the public conversation in our communities. Too often we focus on what's wrong in our communities and the problems, and you know what happens there. We end up in this kind of cul-de-sac, right, where we're all sort of turned inward toward one another, firing at one another, trying to figure out who we can cast aspersions at, who we can affix blame to for not solving these problems, and before you know it, it degenerates into yet another toxic discussion. And when we don't do that, we do these fancy visioning exercises. You ever done those? <laughs> you know, with the little yellow dots and all that stuff. But those visioning exercises are pie-in-the-sky visions that tend to go nowhere. We publish these four-color brochures. We create all these task forces, and nothing ever seems to happen. Americans don't want pie-in-the-sky visions. They want to help move their lives forward about things that matter to them, that things that keep single moms with two kids awake at night where she's worrying about what's going to happen to her kids the next morning, not some pie-in-the-sky notion about 2050, right? And so I think we've got to focus our community's conversation 
on our shared aspirations. Now, so many of you have already started this, but I can't underscore enough that you're not done yet, that we need to do more, we need to go bigger, we've got to go deeper. You know when people start talking about their shared aspirations, something, it's almost magical, but it's not magic happens, it's human. People start to recognize that they're not alone. People start to recognize that even though people around the table may have a different ethnicity, a different income bracket, a different race, a different zip code, that they actually do share some things in common. People start to recognize that they are a citizen of something larger than just themselves. When people start talking about their shared aspirations, they recognize that no single organization, no single leader, no single group could ever solve the problems or the challenges we face or achieve our aspirations. It's going to take all of us to work together, right? When we start talking about our shared aspirations, we start to recognize what we share in common, not all those things that divide us, which are real. But so long as we insist on focusing on what divides us, we will never move forward. It takes focusing on what we share in common that will enable us to figure out what we can start working on and how we can start working on it together. The other part about this is what you do with what you learn. And this I really want to underscore, and we were just talking about this. Clarkson, right? One of the things that you need to do with this knowledge that you're gaining is use it to create more relevant and significant work that the library does. There's no question about it, and many of you are doing that. And my hat is off to you. But I would say that there are even more opportunities awaiting you. That if you take this knowledge and you start to convene other groups in your community, not for you to be the actor, but for you to be the convener, that all of a sudden people will start to recognize that maybe there's something that we can work on together and that the library was the convener of this group and the producer or facilitator of this knowledge for the community, right? This is happening in Clarkson. The city council person is becoming the mayor, right? The mayor now is gonna be able to act all because of the library, all because of the library. All across the country I'm hearing stories of libraries bringing mayors together, city councils, different nonprofits, foundations, businesses, and other groups as the convener and catalyst in their communities. And what's happening is not only are those groups starting to work differently together, they now see the library in a new light. As not only nice to have in the community, but as a central partner of the community. There's an old country song that says, the refrain of which is, I can't see me in your eyes anymore. I can't see me in your eyes anymore. More than anything right now, we Americans, we want to see ourselves and hear ourselves and feel ourselves as part of our public discourse, part of the conversation. By gathering this public knowledge through these community conversations, yes, you can improve your programs. But when you hold this knowledge up and other people can start to see it and hear it and feel it, all of a sudden they can see themselves as part of something larger. All of a sudden they'll come out from their homes and want to engage with others, all because of the work that you're doing. So that's number one. We've got to focus on what we want to create together. Number two, we've got to focus on building together. On building together. It's not just enough to have conversations. We've got to build something together. And I know so many of you are doing this. A number of years ago, you might have heard me tell this story if you've heard me speak before. And if you did, you're probably sleeping, so don't worry about it. But some years ago, I was in Las Vegas where we were doing work. And I was talking to a group of about 15 citizens, much like your community conversations. And after about 90 minutes, I turned to the group and said, so what do you think should happen? What do you think should happen? They told me all about their aspirations and challenges around education, around homelessness, about water crises that they faced. I'll never forget this. There was a gentleman with a beard sitting about four seats to my left. And he said, you know, Rich, what I'd like to do is I'd like to get the 15 people or so around this table together and I'd like to go paint to school. I'd like to go paint to school. And I looked at him 
And I was kind of incredulous. And I said, paint a school? You mean to tell me we just spent 90 minutes talking about all this stuff, including ed education, and you want to go paint a school? And he paused and he looked right back down the table at me, shot me one of these looks. And here's what he said to me. He said, Rich, you know, you seem like a nice enough guy. <laughs> it's not that funny. <laughs> he said, you dress kind of nice. You're wearing a kind of blue suit and a white shirt. You look OK. He said, but here's the thing. You don't listen real good. He said, so let me tell you again why I want to get these 15 people to paint the school. He said, I want to get these 15 people to agree to come out from their homes back into the public square. He said, I want to get these 15 people to paint the school with me so that when they come out from their homes into the public square that we can set a goal together to paint a school. He said, when I get these 15 people together and they come out from their homes into the public square and we set a goal to paint the school, that we can set off on a path and start to succeed. He said, I want to get these 15 people together so that I can get them to come out from their homes. We can set a goal. We can start down a path. And he said, you know what, Rich? Inevitably, at some point, invariably, we will fail and we will fall down. And he said, I want to demonstrate that we have the wherewithal, the wisdom, the courage to get back up, to scrape off our knees, and to keep on moving forward. He said, Rich, I want to get these 15 people together because I want to demonstrate that when we come out from our homes and we set a goal together and we set down a path and we fall down and get back up and we finally paint that damn school, I want to celebrate for once in our community because I'm so sick and tired of the negative news that I hear day after day after day. Now he said, I know painting a school is not going to fix all our systemic issues in education in our community, but here's what I also know. Unless we come together and start doing things together, we will never build the trust and the relationships and the confidence that we can get things done together and we will never be able to tackle the larger issues together. We Americans, we are builders by nature. Our country was founded on building. Our country is founded on innovation. Our country is founded on work. We are builders. It's part of our DNA. I happen to think it's one of the things that makes our country exceptional. We love to build. In your libraries, you're building. Some of you have brought divided communities together. And for the first time, they're talking about where they want to move forward. Some of you have figured out how to bring, where there are absent parents, right? How to bring mentors together, volunteers together in your communities to make sure that kids don't fall through the cracks because there are absent parents in their communities. Over and over again, I read about the stories coming out of Michigan that are about building and doing great things. In Oak Park, Illinois, one of our partners there, David Seleb, realized that homeless people and poor people were coming into his library. And so many people wanted to turn them away. And he said, we can't turn them away. But instead of segregating them or pushing them off to the side, he decided to hire a social worker. And then he's decided to train them in trauma. And then he decided, when he learned more about the community, to bring all the different agencies together so that they could create a continuum of care to give people a leg up in their lives. These stories are happening here in Michigan, too. We are builders. Now, there are some people who will tell you that the stories, as Randy Dykeis and Randy Riley just told you, that the stories are too small here, <coughs> that they're not significant enough, that we can't measure all their impact, that we don't have all the right metrics about them. And I believe in measuring impact, believe me. But here's what I'm here to tell you. The folks who tell you that your projects have to be highly sophisticated and highly complex and really shiny and the best new thing that ever came along and that they have to be huge and if they're not, they're not meaningful. I'm here to tell you they're dead wrong. That what, what is as important about what we do is how we do it. And that we've got to bring people together to build together. 
not simply to do nice things, but to restore our sense of belief that we can actually come together and get things done together. We've got to restore our belief. And that's what's happening in all of your libraries. Third, last point. I think we've got to learn how to tell a new can-do narrative in our communities. A new can-do narrative. You know, these narratives, I heard this in Grand Rapids yesterday. These narratives that we tell each other about ourselves and about our community, right now they're all, they're so negative in so many of our communities and across our country. Right, and these negative narratives, they become ingrained and they dog us. They sort of define our attitudes, they define what we do, they define our behaviors, right? Over and over again, these, these negative narratives. It's like when you have a, in your personal life and you're trying to do something at work and the narrative starts to tell you and your the little voice in your mind starts to go off, right? And you start to say, well, I'll never be able to do this. I'll never be able to get the support I need for this. My boss will never give me the resources I need for this. I'll never get the folks around the table to help me do this, right? That narrative that's just sort of that little voice in our minds. And communities have their own voices, their own narratives. I remember working in Youngstown, Ohio. Anyone here from Youngstown other than Carlton Sears? <laughs> I once told this and the governor was in the room and I didn't know it. <laughs> He didn't like the story, but anyway. <laughs> I was working in Youngstown with Carlton actually a number of years ago. And the governor there, the former governor, had taken over the public schools because the schools were failing. And he created an academic distress commission made up of 15 people. And the academic distress commission decided to figure out a reform agenda for the schools. And so they produced a report with about 150 recommendations. It's the type of report you could download off the internet because it looked like every other community's report. And lo and behold, right before they're about to release the report, there must have been some kind of divine intervention. Because I got a phone call from the foundation president in Youngstown who said, well, we're about to release this academic distress commission reform report, but we've never talked to anyone in the community about education. <laughs> and you laugh. But you know that this happens in all of communities, right? Whether it's about education or the opioid crisis, or about crime, or about taxes, over and over again. I heard this in Grand Rapids yesterday. And so the foundation president said, would the institute come help engage the community about what they want for their schools and higher expectations for their kids? And I said, sure, but only under two conditions. Number one, we get to choose who we talk to. And number two, we get to decide on the questions we're going to ask. And so they said yes to both. And so I just want to tell you a little bit about what we found when we talked to people. And as I do, think about your own community. When we talk to adults in Youngstown, teachers, parents, and others, here's what they told us. When we see kids in Youngstown walking down the street toward us, we cross to the other side of the street. When we look into the eyes of the kids in Youngstown, we believe that they're up to no good. When we look at the kids in Youngstown, their educational potential, we believe that they don't have the potential to learn and to succeed. Think about this. Think about this. This was the narrative of the community that's trying to raise expectations for their kids. We then went and talked to the kids, to the youth, and we asked them about what they think. And sometime into that conversation, they turned to us and they said, we know what the adults in this community say about us. We can feel it. We can see it. We experience it. They said when we walk towards them, they always walk away from us. When they look at us, they have this look in their eyes that somehow we're all robbers or crooks or going to be criminals thrown in jail. When they look at us, they don't believe that we have the potential to learn. So think about it. If you're in a community that has an, an ingrained negative narrative like this one, why do we expect some kid to wake up early in the morning to get on a school bus to go to a school where no one believes in them, to come home to a neighborhood where parents may not be there, where the neighborhood may not be rooting for them, and we expect them to succeed and we want them to succeed? Now, your narrative in your community may be different, 
but I've read enough of your narratives to know that in some of your communities, you have divided communities. In some of your communities, you've had economic tough times. I've worked in Flint. I know the narrative there. I've worked in Detroit. I've known the narrative there. Some of your smaller communities may believe that you're going to be left behind as the other parts of our country prosper and move forward, right? And the question is, what do we do? What do we do to change this narrative? It's not hiring a public relations firm and hanging banners from our street signs saying we're back and everything's going to be fine. Instead, I believe we need to learn how to tell a new story about what's happening in our community. And I believe these stories have to be rooted in what I would call civic parables. You know all parables have like a lesson to them, right? They're usually short and easy to remember. I won't tell you some, my, some of my favorite parables now like the Good Samaritan. But you have your own parables that you're making now. The parables of how your communities are coming together to bring volunteers together to mentor kids. The parables of how you've created new programs to ensure that every child in your community can read. The parables of how you're bringing different groups together to ensure your economic future. We need to learn how to tell these stories. And we can't just tell that it happened. We need to tell how it happened. Like the story in Vegas, we need to tell the story of a group of people that decided to start moving forward to make a difference, about how they set a goal, about how they started to move forward, about how they fell down and got back up, and about how they achieved something, but that it didn't solve every problem in our community, but that it gives us some ray of hope about the future. There are libraries in Michigan that are creating maker spaces right now, right? where people, adults, and children are coming in to create things together and innovate together. We need to tell the story of making that space and of what gets created in that space and what happens as those things get created. But here's the thing. We can't just tell the story once or twice. We need to tell it over and over and over again. The folks in Grand Rapids kept telling me they are swimming in negative news from the media. We have to be a counterforce to that negative news in our local communities. And I happen to believe that the change we need in our society is coming from local communities. We can hold our breath waiting for Washington, D.C., but as you know, it's not going to happen. And we could even hold our breath for Lansing. And I will say at least it ain't going to happen. It's going to happen by our local communities doing it. So here's the thing. As we tell these stories, I need for you to think of yourselves as agents of hope. In fact, I hereby deputize each and every one of you as agents of hope. That part of our job is to spread stories of hope, authentic, real stories, including the blemishes, including when we fell down, including when we didn't achieve everything we sought out to achieve, but that we tried, we brought people together, we built something together, it was rooted on what we share in common, and it's a down payment on our future. We have too much false hope in our society right now. We need some agents of hope around authentic hope. And it seems to me that that's what libraries have been doing since Benjamin Franklin created the first library. And if you remember, that first library only had a few books. It was where people could come together and talk to one another and create things together. Libraries have story times for kids. It's time we had story time for community. And we tell stories of hope about community. So let me close with one. You still with me? Yeah. Let me just close with one last story that I thought about last night. From Grand Rapids to here, and I saw the exit for Flint, right? I think it's 69, Interstate 69. And I'd worked with Flint for a long time in the 90s. And there was a time <clears throat> early in our work much like you, we did a lot of community conversations across the community. And we decided to bring all the folks who had participated in those conversations into one room, just like this. Something that you might consider doing if you haven't done this. And we invited all of them. And it was a January in Michigan. And you know what it can be like in January in Michigan. Right? This is before climate change really took hold. Right? It was snowing. There was a blizzard in downtown Flint. And as you know, back in the 90s, a lot of the streetlights in Flint weren't working downtown, it was really dark, it was cold, it was windy. 
and it was getting time where we thought people should be showing up and no one was there yet. And we were worried that no one was going to show up. And then lo and behold, one by one, people started to walk through what was then called the Ramada Inn downtown right by the Flint River, which was part of the news recently. And they came into the Ramada Inn, they brushed the snow off their shoulders and they warmly greeted one another. And in a room about this size, with about twice the number of people, we went through and reflected back what we had heard in these conversations to make sure that we had heard it correctly and to see whether or not people could see themselves and hear themselves and feel themselves in what we had found. And then at one point I turned to the group and I said, so what do you think should happen next? What should we do? And I'll never forget this. One person raised their hand and said, well, I think the mayor's got to get his act together and do X, Y, and Z. I said, well, what else do you think we should do? And as I asked that question, I saw a gentleman sitting right where your name is. Karen. Right where Karen's sitting right here. He was an older gentleman, much older than Karen. <laughs> much, much, much older than Karen. <laughs> And you know when someone looks at you in a meeting like this and you sense that they want to speak and then they sort of nod you off. So I looked at this gentleman and it looked like he wanted to speak. He was kind of leaning forward and he nodded me off. And so I asked the group again, so what do you think we should do? And someone else raised their hand and said, well, I think the community foundation needs to give out more grants so we can get more money into the community. And then I asked, so anyone else have any comments? And this gentleman, and I looked at him again, I had since found out his name was Mr. Brooks, not Karen. <laughs> and he looked at me again, and it looked like he wanted to speak. And when I was about to call on him, he shook me off again. And so I said, so who else wants to say what needs to happen next? And someone raised their hand. They said, well, the United Way needs to change who they're giving their money to, right? And it needs to be to us. And so I asked again, who else wants to speak? And this time, I saw Mr. Brooks. He was leaning into his chair. And I looked at him, and this time, instead of nodding me off, he gave me a nod yes. Mr. Brooks was this older gentleman. And like a lot of us who are getting older, he decided to stand up. And as he stood up, he grabbed hold of the table with two hands, you know, like some of us older folks here do. And he pulled himself up. And he was all a little bit more than five feet tall. And he stood in a room double the size of this. And he looked out across the room. And at first, he didn't say anything. And much like in here, you could, pin a, you could hear a pin drop. And then Mr. Burks uttered three words, which I will never forget. Three words. He said, what about us? What about those of us in this room? What are we going to do? What about us? The reason why I wanted to come here today when Randy invited me, the reason why I was so excited to drive from Grand Rapids to here, the reason why I was so excited to get up 4.30 in the morning, yesterday morning in Toronto and fly to Grand Rapids via Atlanta to then come here. Oh, <laughs> is because each and every one of you in this room has already answered Mr. Brooks' call. You are Mr. Brooks. What about us? Each of you has already decided to do things. You have decided to improve your communities. You haven't looked to some other group. You haven't looked to some other organization. You haven't looked to some other leader. You've taken it upon yourself and your organization, your library, to do this work. I think we face a fundamental choice in our country right now and in our communities. Will we give in to division and acrimony and polarization and even hate in our society? Or will we decide to choose a different path, a path where we figure out what we share in common and build upon it? You're on the path already to figure out what we share in common and build upon it. And so as you move forward, I celebrate with you on all the good things that you have already achieved. But I urge you to go deeper, bigger, and higher as you move forward to ensure that you remain turned outward toward your community and you have people in your line of sight, that you focus on shared aspirations and what we seek to create together, 
that you decide to bring people together, to build together, to demonstrate that we can have our belief, that we can actually get things done together, and that you operate in telling stories that ensure that we have a can-do narrative moving forward. I'm so proud to have partnered with you and to support your work and to watch all the good things that come forward. Thanks so much for having me.